and welcome to another episode of the Maxwell Institute Book of Mormon Studies podcast. I'm Rosalind Welsh, the host, and today I have a wonderful guest who's also my friend. Her name is Dr. Sharon Harris. Sharon is an assistant professor of English at Brigham Young University. She has the coolest research focus. She studies music and literature in 17th century England. She also um, is a very accomplished Book of Mormon scholar. Often we find that um, people trained in literary readings are already ready to go when it comes to scripture because they're trained in these specialized ways of reading. And so she's written a wonderful book, um, the, A Brief Theological Introduction to Enos, Jerem, and Omni. Um, but today we are not talking about that. Today we are talking about Alma 1 through 29, and we're focusing in particular on some of the highlights of the scholarly research that has appeared um, over the course of Book of Mormon studies on these very, very rich chapters. Uh, these, this portion of the Book of Mormon um, is very well known. It has some of the most beloved stories in it, uh, very, very rich. And so not surprisingly, um, the scholarship yield has been very rich as well. Um, and so we're going to dive into, there's so much, we can't even do a survey, but we're going to touch on each of us two pieces that um, we find to be especially helpful and enlightening when it comes to these chapters of Alma. So um, contrary to my typical practice, I am going to lead off here because we decided that we go through these articles roughly in order of the text itself, focusing on the text um, in the order that we encounter it reading the Book of Alma. So I will start first um, by talking about a chapter from a book. I don't know how well known the book is, but it should be better known. It's a book called The Voice of the People, Political Rhetoric in the Book of Mormon, and it's by a scholar named David Gore. Uh, it was published in 2019 by the Maxwell Institute as part of a series at the time called Groundworks that was um, really digging into sort of scriptural scholarship, scriptural readings. Um, Professor Gore teaches at the University of Minnesota. He's a Latter-day Saint. Uh, he focuses on rhetoric and, and public affairs. And so he brings that lens of rhetoric, public communication, persuasion, and the public uh, square that we all share. He brings that lens to bear. And in this chapter, chapter three, he's focusing on the story of Nahor, which we encounter, of course, in Alma chapter one. It starts off the book of Alma with, um, on a very dramatic note with the Big Bang. So uh, Professor Gore, um, as I said, throughout this book, he brings to bear questions of public communication and the way that we talk to one another and persuade one another. Um, the, the necessity of that kind of public persuasion and also the pitfalls of that kind of public communication. So he sets up um, the situation for us in Zarahemla here, right at the opening of the Book of Alma, um, in a really compelling way. And he notes that at the end of the Book of Mosiah, we saw King Mosiah's decision to recognize the voice of the people and to move away from a monarchy to a system of judges that was responsible in some ways, as I said, to the, the voice of the people, and also to um, legislate a kind of freedom of conscience that um, disallowed people from persecuting one another based on their personal religious choice to join this relatively new church of God that Alma has organized or to not, uh, to not join it, to abstain. So both of these elements of increased personal self-determination um, have brought a kind of instability to Nephite society. And this is kind of a a law of human behavior, that when people can choose, um, they might choose differently. Um, and so in that setting of great social instability and personal choice, the necessity for this kind of contest of belief and persuasion arises. So the importance of public communication, public speaking, rhetoric um, is really heightened here at, in this phase of the Book of Mormon. So we, we see a society kind of divided between Alma's Church of God, which is separate in some ways from the state-sponsored religion that centered on the law of Moses and the temple, 
Um, and then other people, the unbelievers, um, soon to be organized under the figure of Nahor. Um, because of this increased liberty and this kind of social division, he writes, there remains no unifying social vision or narrative for the people of Zarahemla, but rather a contest of beliefs that occasionally rose to the level of violent disagreement. So this context helps us see Alma's preaching in a different way. We know that contention is bad, but <laughs> persuasion has to function as the alternative to violence. And so the message that Alma will preach in his ministry, of course, here at the beginning of the book of Alma, he's still the chief judge and we'll see him adjudicating Nahor's trial. Um, but then what, once he steps down from the chief judgeship and dedicates his entire time to preaching, we see him using elements of rhetoric and persuasion, responding directly to the teachings of Nahor and countering his claims one after another. This is because Alma knows that preaching the word of God is more powerful than the sword and, and responsible public persuasion can be an alternative to violence. So yeah, can I, can I yeah. mention something about that? Yeah. This is really interesting to me because um, in a different project uh, working on the Book of Mormon, I I had always heard about the scripture in Third Nephi. Jesus uh, comes to visit the the Lehite people and teaches that uh, can, the spirit of contention is of the devil. Yeah. And uh, sometimes that might even we might think, oh, you know, you shouldn't fight with your siblings at home. You know, I, when we're when we're children or something like that. And that's that's all true. I'm not I'm not. Uh, contesting that. But I was curious about the word contention, and I looked it up uh, throughout its use in the Book of Mormon, and almost every time it seems to have to do with uh, social and political disagreements and conflicts that can rise to the level of violence. Mm -hmm. So what you're pulling out that Alma wants to offer persuasion as an alternative to uh, this inclination to violence as a way of um, forcing one's you know, one's will or one's position through society is, is really salient, I think. Yeah, yeah. And we see Nehor, I think, as the perfect embodiment of this idea of contention as a kind of irresponsible form of public manipulation that does, in fact, lead to violence. Right. The story of Nehor is pretty well known, probably from the first chapter of Alma, but just as a reminder, Nahor kind of appears out of nowhere as this very charismatic figure. He begins very deliberately preaching a, a way of life and an ideology that's in almost every respect directly counter to the um, the theology of the Church of God that Alma has has been sharing um, and systematizing in in um, Zarahemla. Um, and indeed, uh, as he is. Um, swelled to great heights of vanity and greatness, um, flattering the people. Um, Gideon, a, a, a really fantastic character that we remember from the Book of Mosiah, counters him in public. Um, uh, Nahor is incapable of receiving this kind of public rebuke and, in fact, instigates violence and ends up killing, um, killing Gideon. Um, he's then brought to trial before Alma and ultimately ex executed. So that's sort of the outlines of this um, of this well-known story. But Dr. Gore does such an interesting job, first of all, of pulling out the characters of Alma and Nahor as these very stark contrasts, right? Very, very different from each other. Um, but then even more, um, I think, brilliantly than that, he helps me to understand the opposition between the order of Nahor. So Nahor he, he's found a kind of movement, and it's hard to know exactly what form it takes. It has political ambitions, it's clear. It has kind of religious ambitions, but it isn't quite an alternate church, at least it's never called a church, but it's a kind of social order. And more than anything, it's a way of life. It's a way of being that he's trying to persuade people to come to. And in the same way, of course, Alma's Church of God um, is, is a church and an organization, an institution, but it's a way of being. When you join it and you and you live in this covenantal community, you adopt a particular way of life. And so Dr. Gore describes these two different ways of being. The order of Nahor is a way of being that it is in and for oneself. 
Whereas the way of life in the covenantal church or community is a way of being that is with and for the other. So the order of Nahor is based on selfishness, on class stratification, idleness, um, lack of commitment, lack of responsibility. Everything about Nahor's personality is kind of amplified um, and turned into a sort of um, social way of relating to one another here in the order of Nahor. It's explicitly anti-equality because it, you know, it, it lifts up figures like Nahor as popular who don't need to work for their own living. Um, they're supported by the people. So it's explicitly anti-equality. And that means that it's explicitly anti-King Benjamin, anti-Alma, anti-Mosiah, all of whom through the book of Mosiah had been working to teach this doctrine of human equality, fundamental human equality rooted in our shared um, creation, status as creations of God. Um, the order of Nahor privileges idleness and self-indulgence, expensive clothing um, and show um, is very important. Um, of course, persecution. Um, there's, a, there's, there's a religious element to what he preaches, universal salvation. So there's really no consequences for anything that we do. Um, and in the end, what Dr. Gore shows is that Nahor was so dangerous, both to the religious order, that is the church of God, and also the political order, the reign of the judges, partly because it represented a direct threat um, and an alternate, um, an alternate institution. But even more than that, it was so dangerous because it degraded the character of the people. So if the voice of the people is to be determinative in the political sphere, and if we're to live together in love and trust and common life in the religious sphere, then the character of the people has to be good. Mm. Otherwise, it, it falls apart, right? Um, this is a this is a great message of the Book of Mormon about the dangers of of sort of democratic like social orders is that the people might choose poorly. So it really matters that they're well trained and that their character is firm. And so that is the threat that that Nahor represents. Um, and then on the contrast, you know, we see the, the Church of God, which in almost every respect is the opposite. It prizes peace, human equality, modesty of clothing and consumption. Um, this ethics of neighborliness, of friendly um, interaction and sharing and giving, um, and it's all under underlain by um, King Benjamin's anthropology of human humility and equality. And so um, Dr. Gore helped me see this real um, compelling line between King Benjamin's account of human nature at the beginning of the Book of Mosiah, which is, again, all about humility and equality and neighborliness. Moving through to Alma's church um, in Alma 18, you know, he, of course, was um, converted by Abinadi, but many of the same things come in Abinadi's teaching, pre preaching. So Alma's church is likewise founded on humility and equality and neighborliness and common life. And then moving through to Mosiah's political order at the end of the book of Mosiah, where um, in this um, reign of judges that responds to the voice of the people, it's an ethos of humility and of equality and of neighborliness and of responsibility. So I found that to be a very, very compelling reading of who Nahor was, the threat that he represented, and the kind of stark choice that we see between different ways of life. And even though, you know, me as a reader in the 21st century, you know, I, I have slightly different, uh, a very different political and religious context. Nevertheless, that choice between the way of life and the way of being, I think is still very, very light for me. And it speaks in a very relevant way, I think, to the way we live in the 21st century and the choices that we are still asked to make about how we are going to live in relation to our neighbors and which of these ways are we going to choose. And he ends by making a very compelling case that in a way, all of us in our daily life and choices, in the way that we interact with one another, we are all of us preachers. In this day and age, we're all of us influencers, right? Where we all have a social media presence. Everything that we do and say functions as a kind of persuasive utterance that not only affects us, but it acts on the people around us as well. 
So we, we are responsible for what we do and say, and even decisions that we might feel like are just private decisions that's nobody else's business. In a way, it's a kind of persuasive act. And so we are responsible not only to ourselves, but to our neighbors as well. Um, Can I throw yeah. something in about that? Yes, please. This is, this is actually from another Maxwell Institute book, um, Kate Holbrook's Both Things Are True. Yeah. And she um, she's talking about Nehor um, in, at, toward the end of the book briefly. And one of the things she points out is um, among several lessons of this sad tale, one stands out. Uh, and she says, what we desire influences what other people desire. So just like you're saying that there's a whole, we, we are influencers. Um, Dave, Dave Gore talks about idolatry being a, a way of outsourcing accountability to something else that can't really fulfill those promises. And it just seems like this is so relevant to the temptations that we can face with quick, easy answers that, that aren't actually satisfying. Yeah. Yeah. Very much so. Um, it, yeah, it just reinforces to me once again, how relevant the book of Mormon is to modern life and to the choices that we, um, and the dilemmas that we find ourselves in now. Now the book of Alma is especially full of <laughs> negative examples, <laughs> ways that we should not be, which are helpful, right? It's helpful. Right. Um, and speaking of kind of, difficult episodes and negative examples. Um, you're going to walk us through something, you know, um, the, the, the very difficult story of Alma's ministry in Ammonihah. Um, mm-hmm. And again, we can learn some, we can learn a lot about how to live life in Christ in, from the negative example that we see there. So walk us, walk us through this. Sure. Okay. Well, this, this comes, um, from there's there's a couple of different places that we can find Kylie Turley's work on this episode. Uh, one is an article that she has uh, in the Journal of Book of Mormon Studies, and then also in her uh, brief theological introduction that she wrote as part of the Maxwell Institute series on Alma one through twenty nine. Um, and one of the things I I was delighted to be able to talk about this scholarship um, and include Kylie's scholarship in this episode of in this podcast because. Uh, to me, Kylie's work is one of those rare pieces of scholarship that inspires not just through its conclusions, but also through its method. And, and I know Kylie well, she's a friend. And, um, one of the things that is so that I, I found out about her some years ago is I, I think she knows the person Alma as well or better than anybody I've ever met. She, she's just spent so much time, uh, reading carefully, thinking about the implications, drawing connections, asking questions, that Alma becomes a really live, um, full-bodied, three-dimensional person um, in her understanding. And so it it means that she's able to see uh, what he offers in in the scholarship she writes in the Book of Mormon. And so, um, and and, and maybe I'll, I'll... give the ending first, but at the end of her book, uh, she writes that she says, I might be mistaken about, about what conclusion she draws. She says, my conclusion should be questioned. And yet to question my conclusions, you will need to read scripture. Whether you would agree or disagree with my interpretation of scripture, I consider my efforts a success. If you have begun or renewed your commitment to studying the book of Mormon. So implicit in all of her, um, interpretation is an invitation to to dig into the scriptures. And I think her method of, of engaging um, the scriptures in general and Alma in particular really bears that out. And I'll just say, Sharon, that um, I, I love that passage. Thank you for highlighting it. Part of what I hope is a sort of underlying message that I don't state all the time, but one of my hopes for this podcast is, first of all, by showing a variety of scholarly perspectives to help us know that no single interpretation is definitive. Right. Of course, prophets um, have a... Have, uh, they have the stewardship to declare what doctrine is, and they'll use scripture to do that. Um, for the rest of this, though, no single interpretation is definitive, but it, they can be persuasive to different degrees, as we were just talking yes. about. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and second of all, um, we never want this podcast to be a substitute for reading the scriptures. Podcasts mm-hmm. can be so convenient and wonderful, and we can listen to them, um, but they should never take the place of 
getting to the scriptures ourselves. And I worry sometimes that that might be happening um, in this moment of, of peak podcast. Um, right. So thank you so much for um, underscoring that passage from Kylie's book. Right, right. Well, and, and, and she inspired you to do that. So so maybe we can see how that works <clears throat> with her reading of the Amanai I If I am remembering right, perhaps this get, gets touched on in your previous um, episode talking about the structure of the book with Kim Matheson, but um, maybe we can go in a little bit more detail about setting up what, what happens here. Yeah. So this the scene is that Alma has uh, gone to preach at Ammonai Ha. He's rejected and cast out. And uh, and so he is told by an angel to go back and uh, try again. And, but he's also told you can go in a different way. You'll find someone who will help you. And this is Amulek. Meanwhile, an, an, so an angel told Amulek to do that. An angel tells Amulek, you need to go home and get ready for this man of God that will uh, you need to receive and listen to. So they uh, Alma goes to Amulek. Uh, they stay together for a while, and then they begin preaching together. And and it's a very serious message. So in in Alma chapter nine, um, they he he tells them, "You have to repent, or God will utterly destroy you from off the face of the earth." And they have a this exchange with lawyers and uh, all the. It seems like an, an elite audience in Ammonihah. Um, these people, we find out at the end of the episode, are the profession of Mikor. So exactly the context you've been setting up. They have drunk the Kool-Aid of Mikor's um, message. And they tell Alma, you have no authority here. We don't believe in what you do at all. And we are going this other route. And it's it's a very... I think as um, exchanges and preaching in the Book of Mormon go, it's a very sophisticated one. They have sophisticated questions. They're testing Alma. They're tempting him with money um, and and pushing on Amulek. And, and, and this looks like a sort of uh, can you hang kind of a conversation. Um, and uh, they talk about the resurrection, the fall, the plan of redemption, the priest of the Lord's coming. And in the end, Alma and Amulek call them to repentance and the people of Ammonihah do not take it well. Um, so they want Alma and Amulek destroyed. They tie them up and send them off to the chief judge. And meanwhile, it's Ezra and other men who who actually believe, find themselves persuaded by Alma and Amulek. They're cast out. And then it just jumps into this story that uh, they took the, the women and children. And it says, actually, whosoever believed or who had been taught to believe in the word of God, and they caused that they should be cast into the fire. We don't even hear about them setting up the fire. We just are kind of dumped into this moment where this horrific scene of a fire set up for max execution of those who believe. And it includes the wives and children, um, it seems, probably of the men who believe and then any uh, women and children who have been taught to believe or who believe themselves. And not only that, it says they brought forth, this is in Alma 14.8, They also brought forth their records, which contained the holy scriptures and cast them into the fire that they might be burned and destroyed by fire. And so they've got this terrible scene of of burning women and children and records. But not only that, it says they carried Alma and Amulet to the scene and they made them watch. And uh, Kylie Turley, who who writes the book, she points out uh, this unusual instance of present tense that the whole thing is, is told in past tense, but in a particular verse here, it says that Alma is watching in verse 10, or excuse me, Amulek, the pains of the women and children who were consuming in the fire. So they're being forced to watch it as it happens. I, I mean, this is the kind of thing that I would I would not want to see at all. I don't know if I could, and, and, and Amulek says as much, how can we possibly watch this awful scene? Um, so, what 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 Kylie truly I, I, I want to call her Kylie because I know her as a friend, but also I want to be professional and call her truly. So <laughs> we'll, we'll call her truly here. But um, what what truly says here is she points out that Alma's response is unsatisfying, and she points out the silences that follow this episode. So Amulek seems to just kind of be at great pains. How can we possibly watch this awful scene? Can we please stop it? And Alma's response is unsatisfying and kind of clinical. And he says, um, the spirit constraineth me that I must not stretch forth mine hand. For behold, the Lord receiveth them up unto himself 
in glory, and he does suffer that they may do this thing, or that the people may do this thing unto them, according to the hardness of their hearts, that the judgments which he shall exercise upon them in his wrath may be just, and the blood of the innocent shall stand as a witness against them, yea, and cry mightily against them at the last day. He, he offers a kind of theodicy at that moment, right? right? He wa- he's giving a defense of God mm-hmm. and, you know, trying to make sense of, of how God could allow this evil to happen, but rather famously, mm-hmm. That the Odyssey is something that's often undertaken years later, sitting right. behind, safely behind your right. office desk. So that's when you reflect on these questions, mm-hmm. not in the moment. So it's a kind of misplaced, uh-huh. kind of really rare misfire from Al Knight's and White students, because typically he's so good right. at speaking to his audience. Yes. Yeah. I mean, one of the best readers in the Book of Mormon, I think, yeah. and 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 Turley points this out regularly. That, you know, he knows his audience. He knows how to do a turn of phrase. He knows how to be persuasive. He used to be persuading people out of the church. Now he's yeah. preaching them back into it. So for him, like you say, to have this misfire is really kind of baffling. And so we want to flag that as one thing um, to notice. Um, it seems it seems glitchy. I guess would be one way of thinking about it. And then another thing to flag that truly points out is the silence that follows. So uh, they're, they're made to watch this. And then the chief judge of Ammonihah uh, asks them for a response. And in verse 17, Alma and Amulek answered him nothing. And then many lawyers and judges and priests and all of the people that have been reviling them or, or taunting them, they come to them in prison and ask a series of questions. And it says again in verse 18, but they answered them nothing. And then the judge uh, later commands them to speak again and threatens to burn them. He says, you know, you have to answer me or, or we'll kill you. And it says, but they answered nothing. Or they answered nothing. And so uh, eventually Alma calls on God. They break out of the prison. They go talk to Zezra and they, they, we see Alma speak again. But there is a real uh, hole in his ability to articulate for a while following this. And and Turley suggests this is the trauma response. Um, the way that another scholar put this in looking at Turley's work is that sometimes you need to stop theologizing and just shut up and sit with somebody in pain. <laughs> and that's that seems to be what's happening here. One of the things that Turley points out is that um, we don't have... Um, a record of what Alma says publicly following this episode for five years. We were told that he preaches, but we don't, we're not given his words. Um, And then what we get after those five years is Alma 29. We'll come back to this, that, that we tend to, you know, we've often heard this as, Oh, that I were an angel is a sort of missionary aspirational message, but actually um, in the context of, of Alma 27 and 28, all part of an original chapter, um, in, in Joseph Smith's dictation of, of the Book of Mormon, in his translation, Alma 29 is a lament. And so the first thing we hear from Alma publicly after five years is a lament. Um, one other thing to point out about this. So this is the part that really, wh- why would he have such a terrible trauma response besides the, the atrocity of watching them be killed? Um, is that, well, after they watch this, the chief judge asks a very particular question. Um, he smites them, and then the chief judge says, After what you have seen, will you preach again unto this people that they will be cast into a lake of fire and brimstone? So he's recalling a message that Alma, that Alma in particular said in, in Alma 12, where he says, You have to repent or you'll be uh, subject to hell, and you'll be into a lake of fire and brimstone. And the chief judge says, behold, you see, you had not power to save those who had been cast into the fire. Neither has God saved them because they were of their faith. What say you for yourselves? And says, look, we've created the lake of fire and brimstone. What are you going to say now? And uh, Turley writes, this is not a random question. It's targeted at Alma and aimed to damage him as much as possible. Uh, most likely they're watching, Alma and Amulek are watching friends and probably Amulek's family die very likely his wife and children in the fire. And is he, she, she writes, still not content, the chief judge ensures that Alma understands the brutal irony at the heart of this horror. Alma's unfortunate gospel metaphor about a lake of fire and brimstone prompts the literal lake of fire and brimstone that burns before his eyes. And, uh, and so 
hearing that his words ignited this atrocity silences Alma for days, is the way that truly reads this, and points out, this was so striking to me, there is at least one phrase he, Alma, will never say again in the Book of Mormon, lake of fire and brimstone. Uh, these events redefine his vocabulary. They redefine the vocabulary of the entire Book of Mormon. So uh, truly cites several instances prior to this where people have used this image that, that hell can be like a lake of fire and brimstone. Um, and after people burn women and children alive in a lake of fire and brimstone, the words lake of fire and brimstone are never spoken again by anyone in the Book of Mormon. Yeah. I, I think I had not appreciated how defining of a, of a social, historical, cultural event this was in, in the collective experience of the Lehites that just becomes a thing that is kind of untouchable after this. <laughs> yeah, so it's fascinating and it and it relates so closely to what we were just talking about with the previous um chapter, which is the way that words and reality and persuasion can function. All right, well let's talk now on on a, on the wider note after spending time in Alma one and Alma fourteen. And um, let's move to Alma nineteen. I just feel like moving into a room full of sunshine and light and <laughs> The smell of flowers and music. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, this is a, a wonderful article. Um, came out in 2018, written by two professors here at Brigham University um, in the Department of Ancient Scripture, Nicholas Frederick and Joseph Spencer. Um, both of those names and faces will be familiar to people who have been watching the podcast all along. Um, they wrote an article called John 11 in the Book of Mormon, and it was published in a journal called Journal of the Bible and Its Reception. Uh, this is notable because it's an academic, it's a, it's a secular academic journal, mainstream academic journal. I love it when um, scholars are able to put the Book of Mormon in all of its beauty and strength uh, before uh, the secular world, the academic world, uh, and right. show that it really, really can stand up to the kinds of lenses and scrutiny that um, that the academic world brings brings to bear. So um, it was notable for that reason. Um, but it but it's also just a fantastic reading of Alma 19, which is the story, as as you just sort of alluded to, of the origins of Lamanite Christianity here in the court of King Lamoni. Um, it's a pretty well known story. Um, so in this article by Nick Frederick and Joe Spencer, they look at the very striking parallels between that story and the story of the raising of Lazarus in John chapter 11. So structurally, you can see that it's very, very similar. There's two men in John 11. It's Christ and Lazarus and two women. In John 11, it's Mary and Martha. Of course, in Alma 19, it's Ammon and King Lamoni and then the queen and Abish. Um, and, and so and there's this moment of raising from the dead. There is a moment of the display of great faith. So structurally, we see the we see the parallels. But even more persuasively than that, there are at least five specific phrases that are that appear in Alma 19 that also appear in John 11. So we can see that there are these clear verbal parallels. So the phrase, he stinketh, right? The, the, the question of whether or not the person who is dead is really dead or not. Um, he is not dead, but sleepeth in God. So the idea that actually they're not really dead, they will be raised. He shall rise again. Believest thou this? Again, the question of faith and belief. Cried with a loud voice. And there were many that did believe. So the effect of this episode in, mm -hmm. in stimulating faith in those who, who watch. So these clear verbal links make it very, very persuasive that there's something deliberate going on between Alma 19 and John 11. Mm -hmm. And these scholars make the case that Alma 19 represents a very, very sophisticated and subtle reworking of the story of Lazarus, not in a random way, but in a targeted way that makes a specific theological point. It makes that theological point not by speaking in theological language, but by revising the story very, very subtly. Um, and so 
they walk us through each of these verbal parallels, and I, I won't do that in detail here, but they do it with an eye to seeing similarities and differences, particularly in the questions of number one, who is the Christ figure in Alma 19? And what they find is that actually it's not totally stable. Different people in Alma 19 step in and out of the figure that Christ plays in John 11. So first of all, of course, it's Ammon, um, who is teaching and, um, and inviting and commenting on the faith of Lamoni and the queen. But then <laughs> uh, later in the story, um, both Avish, who, as you, as I just mentioned, is the one who actually touches the queen and raises her from the dead. And then the queen, who cries in a loud voice, which is the phrase that's used um, that for Christ when he summoned Lazarus from the tomb. Both of them, these two women, step into the role of Christ in, in these parallel narratives. It's really kind of incredible, you know. It is incredible, yes. Mm -hmm. And so they draw from that this very important theological conclusion about Alma 19. Um, and that is that we should see Alma 19 as the Book of Mormon's central and principal contribution to questions about women and religion. And it's so it's so significant that um, the male Christian missionary Ammon, who at first, you know, is unquestionably the Christ figure, surrenders his role to these two different women. One is a woman, the queen of high social standing, but the other one is a woman of low social standing, and both of them are racially other from the perspective mm -hmm. of the Nephites. So we see here played out in a story what Nephi had prophesied many hundreds of years ago, that, that Christ denieth none. He invited all to him, male and female, black and white, bond and free. So we see that prophecy specifically played out here in the generosity with which Ammon is made to surrender his prominence as the Christ figure to the queen mm -hmm. and the Amish. So it's a very, very beautiful reading of Alma 19. And I love it because it, it's, a, it's a subtle but so effective defense of the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. And it shows without a doubt that what's happening in Alma 19 is not a kind of facile or um, cynical plagiarism of the Bible, but it is a very careful conversation, revision, teaching, and clarification of the Bible, just as Nephi said that it would be when he foresaw the coming forth of the Book of Mormon to stand hand in hand and testify of the Bible in the, in the last days. Um, this article shows how that is the case, um, and it shows the, the deliberate and sophisticated theology that is behind um, the intertextuality between the Book of Mormon and the Bible. Yeah, that's really beautiful. Good. All right. We are, um, well, we're, we're racing on in our time here. So I want to shift gears now, um, Sharon, and let you um, share one last really, really wonderful and powerful um, piece of scholarship about this first half of the book. Itself. Yeah. So there's, um, there, there are, again, with the, with the previous one, Kylie had, truly had written both an article and a book about this. And, and similarly, uh, David Pulsifer has um, written an article that is in the Journal of Book of Mormon Studies uh, called Buried Swords, uh, but also with Patrick Mason, uh, this book, Proclaim Peace, um, The Restoration's Answer to an Age of Conflict. Um, this is co-published by the Max Institute and Deseret Book, and I, I recommend it so highly. Um, it's it looks at peace building and in particular like what does it take to build peace and with a with a sort of a mounting analysis of uh, what active nonviolence can do. Now this this seems to be something that we haven't typically engaged uh, culturally as as members of the LDS Church uh, as much as as much as we could given some of the stories we have in scriptures. And that's, and that's what brings us to this work for this uh, part of Alma. That in um, the story of the anti-Nephi-Lehi's, the, 
those who converted to Ammon's message and Aaron's message, all the sons of Mosiah and their preaching to the Lamanites, uh, you get this group of, of Lamanite converts who refuse to engage in violence with those who are opposing them. So you have the converts, uh, the Antony Philehes is what they call themselves, and then later the people of Ammon. And they are attacked by uh, other Lamanites. And it says, it doesn't just say that they allowed themselves to be killed, but it says that they went out to meet them. I mean, it's a really astonishing uh, account of the way that they saw these people as as people they loved, as um, brothers and sisters, as 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 part of their part of their kin, and and not people to be um, punished or or complained about, but they they submitted to them. Um, so what what David Pulsifer does in his article is he goes through at length, um, kind of looking at the reception of this story um, in, in the in the kind of the history of reception in the church. Tell and, us just a minute, um, Sharon. Explain for us what the word reception means. Here. Oh, thanks. Yeah. So so basically, what he's doing is he's he's looking at how has this story been interpreted. Um, in Sunday school manuals, in teachings, in the way that it gets talked about by leaders of the church, in the way that uh, regular members of the church are reading it across across the years, and um, it, we, it's it's. I mean, when we think about this story on its face, it's a really kind of arresting, striking story that they would go out to allow themselves to be killed um, by their by their brethren. Um, and what David Pulsifer shows is that, um, over time, there's been maybe perhaps an inclination, uh, among us in the church to explain away the boldness and, and, um, kind of striking quality of that, of that response. Um, and, and I, I won't go into a, a ton of details about this, um, but, Starting kind of with the, when we get a, an upswing of patriotism uh, in the aftermath of some of the world wars, there's an inclination to defend, uh, defending yourself. And I, I don't want to um, say that that's not the case, but what he shows is that as we've talked about, no, the people of God defend themselves, um, There we've had to kind of People have come up with stories or explanations for why this was different and special, um, unique, not something that we should necessarily model, right? So the question is, the Antony Philehes are giving us a really extreme, remarkable model of um, nonviolence, of a nonviolent response. And one of the things he talks about is pacifism as a sort of philosophy and approach and then active nonviolence, which can include a variety of approaches, including demonstrations or boycotts or, or you know, a submission to violence from others without retaliating. Um, and that the Antony Friendly has are doing this kind of active nonviolence. <clears throat> um, that um, approach can be uncomfortable. It, it really can call us to a, a, a level of commitment that maybe is really difficult to swallow. There are there are three parts or ways that we can read this story. <clears throat> this comes <clears throat> from Pulsifer's article. Part one, when they vow to never use the weapons for bloodshed. So the Antony Philehas are converted. They bury their swords and they say they'll never use their weapons for bloodshed. That can be uh, like pacifism. Part two, um, they go out to meet their attackers and we have this act of nonviolence. They also uh, financially support the Nephites who are... Um, protecting them. So, so it gets, well, I'm, I'm sorry, that's part three, but they go out to meet them. And this is this act of nonviolence. And then part three is that they financially support a Nephite army who protects them. And then later the stripling warriors fight for them. So these might be equated to what's often called a uh, just warfare, like a, a, a yeah. rationale, a rationale for going to war. And we can see, we can read uh, various parts of the story in these various ways to, to justify whatever position we may want to take about, about violence. But kind of like you were talking at the beginning about Nihor, um, enforcing what you want through violence is one way of doing it. But the Antony Lehi's offer a very viable alternative. And one of the things that's so striking 
about um, about this story. Um, something that that uh, that they point out <clears throat> is that it was really effective. Like as they go out to meet them and lay down before them and let themselves be killed, it actually stops the bloodshed in many respects. Uh, in many ways, faster than other instances in the Book of Alma. Mormon doesn't decide the question for us, right? Sometimes, mm -hmm. sometimes Mormon um, draws his conclusion very clearly and wants us to see, but here he really doesn't. And you know, in in fairness, as you've acknowledged, the Book of Mormon really does put forth a robust just war theory, right? Mm -hmm. This idea that there are times when innocents are being um, imminently threatened when violence is justified, but at the same time. Let's not forget, it also puts forth these other alternatives that you've laid out, which is a kind of active nonviolence or a kind of total pacifism. And in the end, what Mormon shows, if he doesn't say it out loud, but what he shows is just what Alma says, which is that the preaching of the word, persuasion, changing of the heart is going to result in a permanent change. Whereas in coercively imposing your will through violence Yes. might temporarily make people change their behavior, but it doesn't change their heart. So the problem is going to pop right back up again mm -hmm. as soon as the threat is removed. And of course, this is the, the cycle that we see in Nephite society uh, throughout the book of Alma and then as we get into Helaman. If the hearts of the people are not changed, then the problem will recur as soon as the immediate threat has passed. That's right. So for a long-term solution and for a long-term vision of the ethics of neighborliness and harmony and peace that we're striving for, you know, in light of King Benjamin and Alma, um, we have to change hearts. In That's right. And that is what the anti Lehi's act does. It changes the hearts of their would-be attackers. Some mm -hmm. of them. Some of them. Mm -hmm. Right. But, but at great cost. That's right. Right. Yeah. And, and, and one way of thinking about, so one of the ways that I understand um, Patrick Mason and David Pulsifer's message in the book is, um, and like you were saying, there may be times that violence, and especially in self-defense, is justified, but it's not an ingredient of sanctification. Yeah. Right. Like it, it, it may be something that, that, that comes at the level of justification, but if if in the overall goal of sanctification, there's not there's not a call for a need for a, a rationale for violence. I, that's a really I think a very I don't know breathtaking <laughs> um, idea to confront. Uh, just how how what are we willing to do? Um, uh, this reminded me actually of a, of a quotation from Neely Maxwell, um, a conference talk in 2002 called Consecrate Thy Performance. And he says, no, I don't want to decide the question either. Like you, like you said, uh, Mormon doesn't decide the question. I'm not trying to, to decide that question, but uh, I think sometimes it's useful to be reminded that the gospel asks us for consecration. And there, that's not a partial enterprise. And so uh, what Neil M. Maxwell says is, in pondering and pursuing consecration, understandably, we tremble inwardly at what may be required. Yet the Lord has said consolingly, my grace is sufficient for you. Do we really believe him? So. Yeah. Uh, what a question. <laughs> Do we really believe him? And mm -hmm. in a way, that's the, that's the question that's been asked um, in Every one of the chapters and the, and the episodes and the articles that we've been right. talking about today. So, mm -hmm. Do you believe him? What kind of faith um, is he calling us to? And are you willing? Are you willing to respond to that invitation? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we're we're near the end of our time, Sharon, and I wanted to um, give us both an opportunity to share a particular passage or um, scripture that has been meaningful to us personally. Um, and I'll go first if you like, and then I'll give sure. you the last word here. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to draw attention to, um, you know, there's so much that we could touch on. <laughs> Alma mm -hmm. 5, Alma 7, uh, so many of these incredible sermons that Alma gives as he embarks on this preaching tour, they are so rich. Um, and fortunately, I think they're fairly well known among the 
saying. But I'm going to read Alma 7, 11 through 12, which which may be the best known, among the best known of the verses um, in the book of Alma, but I couldn't not touch on it. Um, and I, I read it this time in light of what Dr. Gore helped me to see, which is that there is a straight line through the book of Mosiah delivering us into the book of Alma, um, a, a, you know, um, putting forth this way of being, this way of life that is about our fundamental human equality rooted in the fact that we are all creatures of God made from dust and unprofitable servants, but that we should, that knowledge shouldn't depress us, but it should turn us outward to serve and give as generously to those around us as God serves and gives to us every day as he gives us breath and life. So with that vision of kind of neighborliness, service, shared common life, I read these famous chapters about the atonement here, Alma 7 chapter, um, Alma 7 verses 11 and 12. And he shall go forth suffering pains and affliction and temptations of every kind. And this, that the word might be fulfilled, which saith he will take upon him the pains and sicknesses of his people. And he will take upon him death, that he may loose the bands of death which bind his people. And he will take upon him their infirmities, that his bowels may be filled with mercy according to the flesh, that he may know according to the flesh how to succor his people according to their infirmity. And what has really struck me is that the kind of knowledge that Christ had to gain through his incarnation, through taking upon him a body, was know-how. Right, you see that right mm-hmm. at the end of, of verse 12, that he will know how to help his people according to their infirmities. Know how is practical knowledge. Right. It's 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 knowledge of how to do things that are useful and helpful. And that really struck me um, that that if this is the kind of knowledge that Christ needed to gain, more than any kind of theoretical knowledge or disembodied kind of understanding of the principles, it's knowing how. Perhaps that's the same kind of knowledge that I'm called to know how mm-hmm. to do in serving my neighbor. Do I know right. how to take care of somebody who is sick? Do I know how to change a bedpan? Do I know how to build a wheelchair ramp? Do I know how to cook for a crowd, right? All mm-hmm. of these practical skills are essential to our shared common life. And in following Christ, we're asked to develop that kind of know-how. That's really lovely, and and uh, gets at the the lived in nature of discipleship. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's great. It's, all, it's about life in bodies, and it always will be. Mm-hmm. Right, that will never change. I found out just a couple of days ago, days ago that my friend's eleven year old daughter has been preparing a talk for church. Um, and with her mom, she looked into the phrase "redeeming love." And this phrase occurs three times in the Book of Mormon, and all of this, all of them in these chapters in Alma uh, one through twenty-nine. It happens twice in Alma's ser- uh, sermon to the church at Zarahemla in Alma five, and then once in Alma twenty-six when Ammon is relishing and enjoying the successes they've had among the Lamanites. Um, and here's the thing that struck me is that each time this phrase redeeming love is something that you sing, um, and and I felt that. So I, I'm a singer. I have a long love of uh, a long love affair with singing and with choirs. Um, specifically, I remember going to the temple on April 6, 2000. Um, this was the day of the Palmyra Temple dedication. And later that evening, I went to the temple. And uh, it was one of those times when you go to the house of the Lord and it feels like it. You know, that that is the description of the experience. Um, and as I left, I could... I I could hardly I remember I needed to hurry and get out the door because I wanted to sing. That sounds so so I don't know idealistic, but it was true. I just <laughs> I I uh, the song How Can I Keep from Singing was this experience that I had. Um I can remember another experience I had uh as a young woman, as a youth in the church with repentance and uh walking away from a situation knowing that I was forgiven and I wanted to sing. And so this beautiful experience, this welling up of, of redeeming love that I felt I wanted to sing. So I set that up, and I want to contrast that with the image of trumpets. Um, 
There's a reference to a trump or trumpet five times in the Book of Mormon, and three of these would have been familiar to Alma. Um, the obvious passage from the block of scripture we're talking about is in Alma 29, uh, verse 1. He says, Oh, that I were an angel and could have the wish of mine heart, that I might go forth and speak with the trump of God, with the voice to shake the earth and cry repentance to every people. And like we've talked about already, this can be interpreted as a, as a missionary type of scripture. Um, but Turley and others uh, suggest that there may be other factors at play, and we can read this as a lament, right? Um, what I want to do actually is just think about how does this uh, image of trumpets work uh, for Alma? Um, he says here that he would tell every soul in, in verse 2 of Alma 29 with a voice of thunder. So maybe we should look at Alma's personal experiences with angels and uh, the images of trumpets that he knows and um, and see what that tells us about, about this passage. Uh -huh. So Alma's personal experiences with angels. Um, in Mosiah 27, we see that the, Alma com uh, excuse me, the angel comes and calls Alma to repentance. And, the, and he and those that were with him fell to the earth. And it says, quote, you know, resonant of Alma 29 too. And his voice was as thunder, which shook the earth. So here's, here's a voice of an angel that, that's thunderous and shaking the earth. In Alma 8, the angel appears to Alma and commands him to return to Ammonihah, and he, and he does this speedily. Alma 10, an angel appears to Amulek, and, and Amulek obeys. And there are other teachings that Alma has about angels, but in terms of these personal experiences that he has, angels seem to be uh, these beings that make people obey, like they get results. <laughs> um, and so that's the idea about angels. Looking at the idea about trumps and trumpet, uh, trumpets in the Book of Mormon, in Mosiah 26, 25, Alma the Elder is praying to know what to do about people who are rejecting the church. And the Lord answers him uh, and says, when the second trump shall sound, then they that never knew me shall come forth and stand before me. And it, and it jumps into this moment in uh, the judgment and resurrection, and it skips the first trump of the people who are faithful. It goes right to the second trump of people calling forth those that, that never knew God, never knew the Lord. Um, here's one more. And in the record of the Jaredites, Alma would have known this record because we see him talk about it to his son Helaman in Alma 37. But in this passage, the um, armies of Coriantumr invite the armies of Shiz to battle with a trumpet call. So in these examples, trumps and trumpets are powerful, inescapable, and severe summonings of some kind. Um, they, they herald or spell out bad news, <laughs> at least in these examples. So we have angels that have gotten results and made people obey in Alma's personal experience. And then we have um, trumpets that call to send a kind of eternal or final reckoning. So what is it that Alma is actually wishing for at the opening of Alma 29? When he says, oh, that I were an angel, you could uh, speak with, the, with a trump. Um, the previous two chapters, which are all part of the same original chapter, talk about the destruction that has happened, the tremendous battle, the worst that they've ever had. Um, and this on the heels of Ammonihah, as we saw, truly points out that, that this is the first we hear of Alma after the terrible experience at, at, the, at the burning of the women and children in Ammonihah. And so it seems like part of what Alma is wanting here is he wants to be a thunderous, inescapable force that can't be resisted or argued with. Um, and then he goes on to say, Behold, I am a man and do sin in my wish, for I ought to be content with the things which the Lord hath allotted to me. Um, I ought not to hear open my desires the firm decree of a just God. And I want to suggest that it's not that it's a sin that he wishes here an angel. It might be the sin that he wants to make people after all of this terrible devastation and destruction and trauma that he and his people have experienced from these battles from the killings at Ammonihah, from the killing of the people of Ammon, that he, he, there's something that is so frustrated and grieving that's kind of bursting inside him, and he wants to make people obey. Stop it. Stop it. Um, and this is really, I think this is really striking, really touching, really 
um, easy to identify with. And there's a few things we can pull from this that God places such a central priority on agency. Um, and he, he won't take away agency. You know, Alma knows that it's a sin to wish to, to make people do what he wants. But like you were saying earlier, having this external force on the outside is not going to ultimately be effective. It's not the same thing as having it come from uh, one's own volition and conversion. Um, it also talks about the power of desires. Right. Um, and what do we actually desire and what does that move us to? But I think, too, it, it looks at the pain of having to deal with others agency, of having to walk with them. And I mean, this is what God does with us. We make bad choices. And rather than give up on us, God says, OK, I guess we will walk this road together. If you're willing to repent and come back, this is going to be harder. This is going to be more painful. But I will stay with you. And, and it suggests that that's what we we need to do as well in, in really sometimes difficult ways. Um, and so it, this, this Alma's, I, I, I am reading this as Alma, Alma's sin is in the desire to compel the desire to coerce. Um, and he knows that he can't do that. Um, but in not doing that in, in refraining from compulsion, that's what allows anybody to sing the song of redeeming love. Nobody can make me sing. I wouldn't have had that experience of wanting to sing the song of redeeming love because somebody told me to do it. That would have actually ruined the whole thing. And it, it, it comes from an individual. And like you, like you've pointed out, trying the virtue of the word of God. Um, this is what the scriptures offer us. If we don't engage them for ourselves, then we can't come to this conclusion ourselves we can have this experience for ourselves and nobody else can provide it for us so that's that's what i wanted to share i think it's a it's a kind of a cool image the singing the song of redeeming love versus kind of being blasted with the trump stop it <laughs> well i find it so compelling so powerful so personal um and and so persuasive what what if what if we can remove our desire to control mm -hmm. and instead just be the sun and the warmth that allows somebody else's agency to grow and allows their hearts to change and allows them to come to yeah. Christ in their own volition. That that's what Le Lehi wanted at the tree. And that's right. That's what where all of us find ourselves is to beckon and invite, um, and then to let God accompany the seeker. Right, right. And and Alma says as much. Um, perhaps I may be an instrument in the hands of God to bring some soul. Yeah. Well, I think that is the perfect place to wrap up today. Sharon Harris, thank you so much for joining us on the Book of Women Studies podcast. This has been amazing. No, thank you so much. Okay. Thanks for having me.